Hey everybody. Hi. How are you? Give me a few minutes. <laughs> it's very tight back here. Take your time, John. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for doing Hello. first. I'm Jessica. Nice Jessica, to you. good to meet you. Jessica. Hello, nice hello. It's John Dugan. So as I was saying, you guys probably know who these guys are, but we have John Dugan, Ari Mahela, uh, best known from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Three. among many other things. Um, yeah, just to get things started a little bit, uh, John, you played Grandpa back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, obviously, like when I met you a couple of years ago at a convention, I was like, this guy's not even a grandfather age now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, How, I'm like, grandpa. Yeah. How, like, whose idea was it when they saw you, you were like 20, they're like, you know what you should play? A 113 year old man, like perfect role. <laughs> uh, Kim Hankel actually, because he was married to my sister. Uh -huh. So it was like some pure nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> it, I was an actor, I, you know, I am an actor, but it wasn't like he just, I was a gas station attendant, and, you know. Not, I don't have anything against gas stations. <laughs> well, I'm just digging a hole here, aren't I? But, uh, yeah, I was doing a children's play in the Goodman Theater in Chicago called The Terry Little Tales. <laughs> Dancing around uh, in tights, telling uh, folk tales and doing folk dances and singing folk songs from around the world. And uh, Kim called me up and asked if I, I'd do this thing, so I quit the play and uh, went to Texas. And, uh, they wanted somebody, I was really slightly built, <laughs> they wanted somebody small uh, to make the big people look even bigger, you know, so Makes sense. Uh, that's kind of how I ended up with the role. Cool. And Ari, right, was that a similar story for you? How did you get in with Texas 3? Um, no, it was quite different, uh, but strangely enough, John and I are the same age. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think it's kind of funny that he played Grandpa in the original, and <laughs> almost 20 years later I play Leatherface, and, but we're the same age. <laughs> but um, no, my my route to the part, I guess in a sense it was nepotism. I was very good friends with Jeff Burr, who got hired to be the director. Uh, he Jeff, who has a great reverence for our industry, offered the part to Gunner. And I think that was right and proper that he did that. Uh, of course, I didn't know about that. <laughs> but uh, but Gunner was uh, unsuccessful in negotiating a deal with New Line, so it left the part open. And I was like the uh, Jeff Burr and I have a uh, uh, an expanded group of friends, all film geeks, you know, writers, uh, directors, actors, prop people. And, uh, you know, when film geeks get together, they always talk about their projects. And th everybody was at a 4th of July party. I was not because I had been at a 3rd of July party. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, you know, they, the, the movie was pending. They asked Jeff who, who, who he was going to cast as Leatherface. And it was like, it was like almost a unanimous, unanimous decision that since Gunner wasn't going to do it, I was like the next logical choice. So... Is wow. <laughs> and it is very much who you know in this business, huh? Yeah, absolutely. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> and John, you actually came back and played Grandpa again almost 40 years later. Yeah, 30, 39, 38 or 39 years yeah. later, yeah. Did you bring anything different the second time around, or did you... you no, some more not a whole lot, it? no. Uh, I, uh, I was begging him to give me one line. You know, I got a great idea for a line. And just let me do the one line. No, no, just sit there, you know, and uh, do your grandpa thing. You know, so. it's probably creepier that way. Mm, yeah, in retrospect, that line would have kind of blown the whole grandpa thing. But uh, to answer your question, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the same, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and Ari, I know that you have a background in wrestling. Uh, what do you bring, like how do you bring wrestling into the roles that you play? Does it come through at all? Well, actually I went, I went the backward route. I, I'd already done Chainsaw 3. 
and many things before I ever got into wrestling. Oh, okay. So it's and, back and forth. Yeah, you know, because I used to have really long hair, and for some stupid reason I bleached it blonde. <laughs> 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 well, because, you know, people would always thought, hey, hey, Jesse, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went backwards. I went, you know, like most wrestlers, start with wrestling and then segue into movies. I started in movies and segued into wrestling. Uh, I, I didn't have much of a career because I got into it too old, mm -hmm. but I was in the same wrestling school as John Cena, though I do not have a clear memory of him. <laughs> uh, no, for the reason, uh, because, uh, you know, the, 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 the training goes in rotations, and he was, he was much further advanced than I was, so I didn't get in a ring with him or, or train with him. Uh, but I remember him being at the wrestling school, and one of my very good friends, ironically, who was cast as Leatherface in the 2003 remake uh, and got hurt and replaced, uh, 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 Brett Wagner. I don't know if you know about his story, but he was, uh, he was cast in the 2003 remake, uh, got hurt, took a day off to go to the doctor, and they replaced him. Well, that, that's a side story, but Brett, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you didn't hear that? No, oh, that yeah. sucks. Yeah, it does. But uh, Brett actually gave John Cena his original gimmick, the prototype. If anybody's a wrestling fan, uh, uh, deep into the, that was uh, John Cena's original gimmick. You know, Chuck? Did you know that? Yeah. Are you a wrestling fan? My friend Ripley is. Who? What? My friend Ripley is a huge wrestling fan. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, all right. I yes. You are? Oh. All right. Okay. So, well, uh, well, let me tell you something right... Wait. Well, let me tell you something right now, brother. I don't think you know who you're dealing with. <laughs> Brooke Bronson, the Iron City Savage. 300 pounds of coiled steel and sex appeal. Yes. Men fear me. Women women love me. Children adore me. I am the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> I, got, I got to tell you a little side story. I got to tell you a little... So when I had my hair bleach blonde, and my my goatee bleach blonde, I was getting gas, and you know, uh, at this gas station like once a week for like six months, right? Finally, the kid comes out and he goes, "Hey, Mister, can I ask you a question?" I said, "Yeah, kid, what do you want to know? Did you have your face surgically altered to look like Hulk Hogan?" <laughs> 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 no. Beautiful. We're getting away yeah. from the chainsaw stuff. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. You got another little fan. Yeah. Um, was it fun doing the scenes in the other place? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's it, it it it's. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Right. Working in the motion picture industry that includes. TV, commercials, and horror movies, it's all fun, man. Because look at this. Look at, look, look at all the good stuff that happens. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you have a trailer where you can throw all your crap, and they got a little bed you can lay down on. And uh, when you get there, the first thing they ask you is if you want something to eat. It don't matter if it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the morning. They'll make, they'll make you a sandwich. And that's just to hold you over till lunch. Okay? Uh, usually they're very nice people, and they all call you sir. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you get a little bit of money. And, uh, you know, and here's the best part. So after you eat your sandwich, and then you go to makeup and wardrobe, uh, as soon as you arrive at the set, your time starts. Six hours after you show up, they have to break you for a set-down lunch or dinner. Yeah, and if they don't, they have to pay you a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, how can you beat that? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's the best thing I've heard all day. <laughs> what, what do you say? The best thing I've heard all day. Yeah, I know, huh? Me too. I mean, why not? <laughs> That's why we do it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I know you're a big scary dude in the movies and you're a ghost hunter. Yes. But what is the scariest thing that you ever saw? And do you think you're ever going to get your own... That is an excellent question. Let me start at the end of that question. I can understand why we don't have our own ghost hunting show. 
you know, we were, we were on uh, uh, Ghost Adventures, and it was one of the most popular episodes they ever did. And we thought, uh, Kane, Rick, and I thought that that would be a springboard to our own show. And, they, they, and it, it blows my mind that we don't have one because every time you turn on the TV, the, uh, there's, a, there's a new ghost hunting show on some channel. So do I think we're ever going to get our own show? I, I've got my fingers crossed, but... Uh, I can be your thank, lawyer. Huh? I can be your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I don't know. And what's the most scariest thing I ever saw? Yeah, like in your ghost hunting, stuff like that. Nah, that stuff don't scare me. Oh, no. Not surprised. Uh, huh? <laughs> what? Because uh, listen, listen. The first time we ever went ghost hunting, we went to uh, the Omen House. You know the Omen House oh, yeah. uh, on Cielo Drive, where down the street from where Sharon Tate uh, got killed by the Manson clan. Well, that house, that actual house doesn't exist, but about 500 feet down the road. That street, there's another house that's owned by Dave Omen, and he claims that all the spirits from the original house, after it got uh, tore down, that all the spirits inhabited his house, okay? Ooh. Well, that's what he claims. Uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what he claims. So, uh, Dude, we, we, you feel that? we were in his master bedroom, you know, with all the equipment and stuff. Huh? What? Dude, I just got so cold, dude, all of a sudden. <laughs> no, I can't hear. I got a medically diagnosed hearing loss. Um, huh? Huh? What? <laughs> but uh, somebody, asked, here, somebody asked Dave Oman because we were in his bedroom, you know, and he's talking, oh, yeah, they're in here all the time. And somebody said, aren't you afraid of the ghosts? He goes, why? You have more to fear from the living than the dead. Ooh. That's true, though. Yeah. yeah. So. Awesome. Uh, so going back to the title of this is Saw's Family. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about yeah, Texas Chainsaw that drew you in? And especially for John, you've been in several different movies of Texas Chainsaw. I have done three of uh, yeah. the films in the franchise. Two as Grandpa right, right. one as a uh, cop. When I got to spend the entire day you know, the, doing a scene with Renee Zellweger <laughs> when she was 22 years old. <laughs> and I was 40. Um it was a long time ago, <laughs> but <laughs> um, it was before she was Renee Zellweger. I mean, that was her name, but she <laughs> nobody, you know. And uh, she got she and Matthew McConaughey was also in that film. They both hit it big before the film was released, <laughs> and so they had their people kind of slow down the process of us getting that film released mm -hmm. because they didn't want it <laughs> released. <laughs> And of course, they eventually lost the case. But uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I guess for the opposite, like, why are you still supporting Texas Chainsaw? What brought you back? Like, what what is it about this movie that keeps you interested in uh, well, it? Well, the original film really changed uh, not just the, the independent horror film scene, but independent filmmaking in general. You know, and. Uh, Proves that you can make a really quality project for very little uh, yeah. money if you have the right people on board, you know. And we were all in the original Chainsaw. Uh, many of us had experience in film, but all the actors were actors. All, all the filmmakers were filmmakers. And, you know, all, everybody that worked it were you know professionals in what they did. You know, so it wasn't like getting all the money together and getting your neighbors, you know, dressing your, putting the antlers on your neighbor's dog and, and you know, slap some makeup on the neighbor's kid and, you know, you know, making a movie, you know, it was, you know, a professional endeavor with, you know, very talented people. And we made history that, that summer and I'd like to, you know, I'd like to support to keep the legacy alive, you know, and we do have, uh, possible TV show uh, in the works coming. Mm -hmm. We finally have an official website, TexasChainsawMassacre.com or whatever it's called. <laughs> Hoping nobody else took that domain. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, what did you pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But um, Kim Hankel has kept a tight rein on the actual 
name, the title. He's always on the title. So every subsequent film that's been made, they've had to come to him and pay him money, you know, just to say, you know, if I were to open up the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Bar and Grill, I'd probably have to go to Kim Henkel and, you know, get permission to use the name. He'd, even though that we're related, he'd probably charge me an arm and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, do you have any special thoughts about Texas Chainsaw? Is, it, is there something like when you got the offer, you're like, yes, because of these reasons? Well, I was thrilled. I mean, you know, that's what I went to, to Hollywood for. I, I set my cap for Hollywood to go out there and become a movie star. Uh, and I wasn't going to quit until I succeeded. And um, the fact that my first starring role in a movie happened to be a horror movie that uh, I was very familiar with as a horror fan. That was, uh, you know, the the proverbial icing on the cake. I mean, when I was a little kid, I used to read Famous Monsters of Filmland. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'd be in my room, man, I wonder how you get to play Frankenstein. How do you get to play, the, you know, the Wolfman? Boy, that'd be kind of neat to do that. And uh, then when I uh, got older and found out that acting was actually a profession, that's what I wanted to do. So when I got the part as of Leatherface, it was my... My childhood, um, uh, my childhood fantasy, be meeting my adult ambition. Boom! And it was a perfect, perfect uh, uh, moment. And I had always wanted to. Part of the things I wanted to do, I wanted to go to Hollywood and make movies with my friends. And oh boy, guess what? It happened. Uh, I don't know how familiar anybody is with the movie, but there's that big uh, uh, body pit scene at the beginning of the movie. And several of my friends are in that scene. And I, and I wasn't even working that night. I came out to the set just to hang out, and we were all sitting at a table, and I'm, go I'm going, hey, boys, we did it. We're here in Hollywood making a movie. And uh, it was a pretty cool moment. Yeah, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, that actually leads into another question I had. Do you have any special times on any of the movies that you've worked on where you're like, you know what, that time behind the scenes was like one of the best days of my life. We had like a really cool moment. Yeah, yeah is there anything you can share hey, with My us? first day on set, um, and I wasn't working. But I, had been, I was on the uh, red eye from, from uh, Chicago to Austin. I was picked up at 6 a.m. at the airport by Kim Henkel. He said, "Do you want to go to your place and sleep for a while? Do you want to? Uh, you want to go out to the set? They were starting already. Just don't take me out there." Mm -hmm. And uh, my first day there, and they were, they were shooting at the old house, the old stone, the old deserted stone house that was their grand grandfather's place, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Paul Partain was sitting all alone behind his giant Cadillac convertible with the red leather interior <laughs> and the fins like that fucking long, I think it was 1967 at uh, Caddy. And uh, he was sitting in his wheelchair <laughs> and he had taken lawn chairs, like folding lawn chairs, and set them in like a semicircle conversation group around him, you know. But nobody was sitting, <laughs> people were over there and he was sitting all alone. And he was like, just starved for conversation. And I was like, howdy partner, Hi, I'm Paul, what are you? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm John playing crowd. Oh, sit on down here next to me. He goes, grab yourself something to drink. And he had a huge cooler and the trunk was open on his, on his car. He had a huge cooler, it was all iced down, filled with uh, 16 ounce bottles of Coca-Cola and uh, cans of Budweiser. <laughs> so I grabbed a beer, 6 a.m., you know, and I uh, sat down and we started talking and became fast friends. And nobody realized, uh, you know, what a nice guy he actually was. I, I knew because of that one day, you know. But everybody who had a scene with, he, he remained in character with. So they just thought he was a, that way, that he was just an asshole, <laughs> you know, which is probably good. I mean, this is part of the genius. I'm, I know I'm getting in my digressing and everything, but <coughs> part of the genius of Kim Hankel and the way his mind works is is uh, an example of it <coughs> is the is the the role of Franklin because he is the first handicapped character in cinematic history 
to not be a sympathetic character. <laughs> You're like, Jesus, guy's an asshole, you know, even though he's like a paraplegic in a wheelchair. <laughs> so when he dies, you're almost like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, shut that whiny bastard up, you know what I mean? <laughs> that whole, you, you, Sally, you know, that whole, that voice, and then, they took the keys, they took the keys, oh my God, they took the keys. <laughs> they, they, give me the flashlight, you know, that whole thing, which is shot just by the headlights of the van mm -hmm. and the flashlight. Uh, Danny Pearl, who's a you know a very well respected cinematographer now, and it was his first film job, his first feature film. He's only twenty three years old, <laughs> and uh, that's part of his genius. That scene right there, but you know, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. <laughs> Franklin, no, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, bear down and push. <laughs> Franklin of that whole scene, and you know that's that's Kim Hinkle's mind, you know, to make the cripple guy an asshole. <laughs> anyway, that was that first day meeting Paul to answer your question. Awesome. I actually heard from the late uh, Joey Ramone. Apparently, he was obsessed with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, really? Anytime he would meet somebody new, he would make them sit down and watch the movie. And I think he loved the scene where he like rolls down the hill in the wheelchair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, right off the bat, abusing this poor guy in a chair. You know, I saw it in a movie theater many years ago in Great Man, Texas. So it was sold out. And they found an old 35 millimeter print. Part of it had Spanish subtitles. It gotten part of the, one of the reels from Mexico or something. And uh, the whole beginning with John Larroquette's uh, voiceover and the scroll was missing from it. Uh, but when the van door opens and Franklin wheels into the shot in his wheelchair, everybody broke into applause. You know, hardcore fans. So, that was a couple of years after he uh, passed away. So. Yeah, but uh, speaking of hardcore fans, we have some here, and I imagine some of you have some burning questions for these guys. Does anyone have something like asked? Uh, yeah, the one right on the end with the hat. <laughs> That's Chuck. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, RA. When you played Leatherface, um, uh, what were some of the uh, steps you played to not make yourself a gunner clone? And um, John, um, what was the most difficult thing about working on that set? Do you want to go first? Yeah, the most difficult thing was the makeup, <laughs> probably. Sitting in a makeup chair for seven hours and then going to work for 25, 26 <laughs> in Texas in, in August. Uh, with no relief. We had an old Winnebago kind of thing that they used for wardrobe and makeup. And, um, it had like an old air, you know, window unit stuck in there. It kind of, you know, and, and it was cool. And it was kind of cool in there, but you couldn't, and it, with all with two pounds of liquid latex glued down to your face, you couldn't get any relief anyway, you know. Uh, so that was the most difficult part. And I would actually, between setups, I just, you know, zen out. I, I had to. So if I started thinking about how uncomfortable I was, I, I'd want to just fucking rip it off, you know. So that was the hardest part. And uh, what, what I did to make Grandpa, you know, besides just sitting there, uh, but Kim and I had talked about the uh, embryonic, you know, the, the man is so old that he's reverted, you know, he started getting, turning into a baby again, you know, an embryonic old man. And he said, so, you know, when the finger sucking thing, he says, I want you to do it like a, a maybe reminiscent of a child nursing. And he said, have you ever seen a child nursing? And I had, you know, three nieces that my, my well, a nephew and two nieces that my, sister had breastfed and you know I'd seen plenty of nursing going on in my life and uh, I knew exactly what I meant so when that scene uh, happened you know 
I knew exactly how I wanted to play it. Cool. And uh, I think the question for Ari was, how did you not well, Chuck, repeat? Well, Chuck, um, you know, buck, bo, buck, huh? chuck, chuck, bo, buck, banana. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't conscious, consciously try not to imitate Gunner or Bill Johnson, the other Leatherface prior to me, but um, everybody's different, you know, uh, and it, it would be impossible to be a clone of the two previous guys. There are certain uh, high points or parameters that you have to hit because it's already been established for the character. But then the the, inter the rest of the interpretation is open to my physicality, what was written by David J. Scow, and what was directed by Jeff Burr. So, you know, I did say uh, I I was familiar with both of the movies, quite familiar with both of the movies, uh, and you know, before we started shooting it, I s said something to Jeff about watching. Should I watch the other ones? He said, No, don't. You know, just to, to get them fresh in my mind. So, I, you know, I just, what's on, I'm a big believer of what's on the page is, goes on the stage, you know. And it's my job as an actor to interpret what's written, interpret that into physical embodiment. And, you know, so there was no, there was, there was no conscience attempt e either way to not imitate or try to imitate. It was just... Grab the chainsaw and go. Uh, he did an amazing job. Huh? He did an amazing job. Well, thank you, Chuck. You're great. <laughs> I'm so proud of uh, you. Yeah, give a question as well. <laughs> about the guy way back there. Yeah, actually, this uh, lady over here oh, with the, the maroon. Um, yeah. You talked briefly about the next generation and Texas Chainsaw 3D, which were both um, in these mid 90s, 2000s. <laughs> I haven't seen it, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was in uh, the Next Generation, but I'd never seen the whole thing because they didn't they didn't give me a copy, and I was certainly wasn't going to buy one. <laughs> um, just out of principle. <laughs> um, but uh, working on. Uh, on both the next generation and uh, 3D was a, a pleasure. On next generation, I got to work with Kim Henkel. He, he directed it, and uh, um, and the day that I worked, both uh, Paul Partain and uh, Marilyn Burns and myself were in the same scene. If you watch the film again, and uh, I played a cop who at the hospital who's talking to Rene. Renee's character, and there's a a, uh, a male nurse or orderly or something wheeling a, a woman on a gurney past us, and we both stop and watch her go past. And it's Paul Partain pushing Marilyn Burns. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's like a reverse kind of thing. <laughs> cool. And we got to have lunch together, Marilyn and Paul and I, and. Uh, that was the last time I saw uh, Paul, and uh, it was a joy to be together again so many years later. You know, it was 20 years later. I hadn't seen Paul in 20 years. I'd spoken to him on the phone. It was all, all was kind of kept, we were all over the place, you know. Because <clears throat> I'd gone back to Chicago, then I'd gone to L.A., then I'd gone to Chicago, then I'd gone to San Francisco. Then I went to Chicago, <laughs> and then so, uh, so that was terrific. And then uh, the same thing with doing uh, Chainsaw 3D. I got to work with. Uh, I didn't actually work with Marilyn on that, but she was in town working at the same period that I that I was, and uh, you know we stayed in the same hotel, and, uh, and Gunnar and I had a scene together, uh, which was marvelous, and he actually had a line. Really? I didn't get a line. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a line. <laughs> Don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um. Uh, but we did have to have. We had a, a, a 
long lunch together to the point where they were setting up for dinner around us. <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> 18 beer bottles and wine glasses all over the table. And uh, I said, maybe we better settle up and go somewhere else and let these people get on with their day, you know. So we moved the party to a, a bar you know, <laughs> and continued. But, you know, I had just a wonderful time in Shreveport working on that. So to me, it was seeing the people being reunited with people I'd worked with when I was 20 years old, you know. And working and getting paid. And, and, you know, in 3D, it was like I had my own trailer. I got paid really well on time. <laughs> nice, you know. Important. There was a cooling tent with an air conditioning going on. But it was 106 degrees at 10 o'clock in the morning in Shreveport, Louisiana in August. And I'm in full makeup and a wool suit again. You know. <laughs> I stepped out of my uh, trailer to have a smoke. I go back where I used to smoke. <laughs> before they took half my jaw out. <laughs> but by the way, if you smoke, don't anymore. Um, but uh, so I step out to have a smoke and there was Carl Mazzacone, the executive producer and the guy from, from Lionsgate Films over there talking to a couple guys. He goes, John, I went, Carl? He goes, and I walked up and I said, what the fuck, man? <laughs> and he goes, what, John? I said, you know, 20 or 38 years later, and here it is again. I said, he said, what? I said, I have a full makeup, a wool suit, and it's 106 degrees at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, you guys, what's with you guys? You know, have you never heard of winter time or anything? <laughs> and he goes, uh, John, I'd like you to meet somebody. He does so and so. And they were like, Big con money contributors to the film from New York that had just arrived in town. <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> I love what you've done. <laughs> I think there was a question at the back, uh, Denim. <laughs> I guess primarily for our end, given the physicality of the role playing for those calls on set, was Sorry, what was? Can you the physicality of the web page role, any close calls on set? Oh, okay. Any, any, quote, any, any close and calls? Do the physicality of the uh, Leatherface role. Any close calls on set? Yeah. Any accidents? Any oh, almost uh, accidents? <laughs> um. No, not for me. Awesome. Do you do your own your own stunts? Like when you're Leatherface? Uh, Kane doubled me. He was a stunt coordinator, and he doubled me on some things. That so, makes sense. so, you know. Um, I guess I was too valuable to be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Put in there, that's fine. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, uh, um, so yeah, I didn't, nothing, for me, nothing, no, no peril. But that's, that's the beauty of working under the AGS of the Screen Actors Guild. They don't let you be put in peril, and they make sure that you have, what, what, what do you get when you're working under the Screen Act? where's that kid? <laughs> what do you get when you're working? What? What do you get when you're working? You get money. No, you get a trailer. <laughs> Remember? You get a trailer and a air sandwiches. sandwiches. Air conditioning, a little TV. Oh, huh? And a little a little TV. Yeah. You know. So. Did you get somebody to change your bed for you? Huh? Did you get somebody to change your bed for you? Change my bed? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it wasn't. It, it, it didn't have any sheets, or they don't have sheets on them. They're just uh, like a day bed, you know, like a yeah, like a like a like a couch. But yeah. So anyway, back to the guy in the back. Yeah, you know, everything's uh, kind of easy peasy when you're when you're working on a you know a a fairly big budget movie that's uh, signatory to Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> There's, there's somebody right there's a yeah. woman back there yeah <laughs> so uh, when filming the original i read that there were some onset injuries and early burns finger was cut i was just wondering how the actor handled that were there any sort of hard feelings or things that sort of it? no not really we, we were young and uh and there was no union affiliation for one thing we would they, they would have shut us down the heartbeat back then <laughs> that what we you know went through but um no, I, we were kind of, we were young and really enthusiastic and willing to do anything that it took to get, you know, to get the shot. And uh, Marilyn, you know, was, she's, <laughs> you know, what we put her through. Good God, what a trooper. 
but you know the cut finger <laughs> I hit her in the head with the even though my hammer was a foam rubber head it had a hickory handle that it was one of those kind of hammer heads that a little bit of the handle comes out of the end of it at the top I caught her with that because I wasn't supposed to hit her but you know so I was a near miss but I caught her with that right here and if you watch the foam again you'll see it there's a cut back here in her hairline um, and then you know the the that broom that <laughs> that uh, that Jim Cedar was hitting her with in, in the in barbecue shack he broke that broom over her her back or her head or something so he just kept that little half the half handle as a stick to poke her with and Jeez. you know <laughs> torture her <laughs> <laughs> See in the pickup truck. Now, don't you worry, none. <laughs> you know, how can you help but worry when we know? <laughs> you know, but uh, God, he was wonderful. There were just so many wonderful performances in that film. You know, everyone was just so spot on. And you know, no, there was complaining. Of course, we were all miserable. You know, and we pissed and moaned amongst ourselves. But when you know, but when the cameras was the camera was rolling, it was all work. You know, let's get it right, let's get it done, and go home. <laughs> Come on, let's kill her and get the hell out of here. <laughs> and, uh, to, to illustrate the con contrast between the conditions on the original movie and conditions on number three. Uh, I don't know how well you know number three, but there's a big fight in the body pit. That was a that was a, a pool, you know. That was a man-made pool, and it was heated. But they they had custom-made wetsuits for us to wear under our wardrobe when we were in the water. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Must be nice. Oh, do you still have it? No, I gave it to I gave it to a friend of mine that's a surfer. Nice. <laughs> And he's my size. Dangerous yeah, daddy. Surfer. Yeah, da big dangerous daddy. Big daddy. No, I gave it the dangerous Danny Daytona. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like somebody in one of those beach movies, you know? The, the, the big surfer. They're all dancing around the fire. <laughs> and I'm interested to know, seeing as both of you have played characters with so much makeup on, where's the weirdest place you've been recognized out in the world that someone's like, hey, I know who you are. <laughs> At walking down Franklin Avenue in Hollywood, California, 19, oh gosh, 77, and somebody stopped me. But I, I thought, oh my God, nobody recognizes Grandpa. Mm -hmm. So I goes, aren't you an actor? I said, yeah. Of course, it's Hollywood, so that was a wild guess on his part, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, he goes, yeah, I saw you, and I was like, yeah, I'll text this chase on Master, right? He goes, no, in a play called The Line in Chicago. <laughs> I was like, oh, and I was a little disappointed he didn't recognize me. <laughs> but then, you know, we stopped and chatted for you know, quite a while. He goes, yeah, we, we actually had a, we, we had a beer together uh, in a, a bar next to the theater after the show. I was in there, you came in. And I was like, and I, you know, I remembered him after he said that, you know. But then I, I got recognized by a vendor in the uh, uh, Nashville airport like uh, about a month and a half ago. The guy was selling bananas and water and stuff. You know, it was like a kiosk kind of thing. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, John. Do I know you? Yeah, yeah. I said, so where are you heading this weekend? I was like, well, you know, uh, 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 Massachusetts? <laughs> Why? He goes, well, you're your grandpa from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? I was like, yeah. He says, yeah, I met you at a con a few years ago. So. Uh, for, for me, I think it was, uh, I checked into this motel in southern Virginia, and uh, I was getting ready to leave the next day, and the housekeeper came up to me and goes, you're an actor, aren't you? And I said, uh, yeah. Uh, how did you know that? I saw you on Game of Thrones. <laughs> I had never did Game of Thrones, <laughs> but but you know then the cat was out of the bat you know so yes when I admitted to being an actor then I had to I had to explain but 
you know, I don't go around telling anybody yeah. because if if you have to tell who, if you have to tell people who you are, you ain't nobody. You know what I mean? So if people recognize me, my fr a lot of my friends get a big kick out of. Hey, you know who you're walking beside? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. I, it makes them happy, so I let them do it. We were all in, a, uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. I must have been about seven of us or something. We had this wing joint called, like, Quaker, Quaker Steak Wings and something. Qu Quaker Steak and Lube. Right. Yeah, 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 that place. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was just in Erie Thursday. It was across the street from our hotel, and, and the promoter of the Erie Horror Fest had set it up so that our per diem was attached to the um, hotel bar and restaurant which was conveniently closed every time we got back to the hotel. <clears throat> and, I, you know, I thought, you know, on the way back the second time, that the driver was taking a really circuitous route back to the hotel. It was taking us forever to get there. And, uh, and of course, we got there, and they just closed down the hotel, restaurant, and bar ten minutes before we arrived. And uh, so, anyway, we all walked across the street to the Quaker Steak, and it was me, Sid Hay, uh, Tony Moran, I think Tony Moran, and then uh, the whole Chainsaw Gang, and, uh, shit, uh, somebody else, maybe Michael Berryman, but we just kind of took over the whole bar, and it was pretty empty, and there were some people shooting pool over there, and, uh, Nobody recognized us or said anything. Finally, Ed Neal couldn't stand it any longer. <laughs> Don't you realize who you have here? <laughs> and the bartender said, well, I thought you were all kind of unusual. <laughs> and uh, he said, "This we're like the royalty of the horror film industry here. You have everyone. This is so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. So -and -so. There's Grandpa, there's so-and-so, so-and-so. And then, of course, everybody gathered around, and our time alone was... Destroyed. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're running a little short on time, but maybe you can tell us what's next for you guys. What are we going to see you in next? Where can we expect to find you? I just had two films released in the last couple of months: uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is uh, Tom Holland, uh, uh, directed by Tom Holland, uh, co-written by uh, Victor Brooke Miller, who wrote the original uh, Friday the Thirteenth. And I play Uncle Charles, and I played it. He's a very, very bad man, and it was a rocking good time to play it. And I'm very proud of it. I hope you see it. And then just last week, uh, Different Behavior was released on all formats. Uh, and in it, I play a, a kind of a washed up alcoholic. Uh, is really out of character for me. <laughs> so I cracked myself up. <laughs> Washed up alcoholic, but uh, uh, a homicide detective who teams up with a washed up alcoholic private investigator to track down a serial killer, deviant behavior, and that was just released this week. All right, what about you? What, what's next? I have a movie that I hope will be coming out soon called Ride Hard, Live Free. It's a biker movie. Oh, I, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, 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 I don't know why I got cast in it. <laughs> Bizarre. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty cool because we actually worked with real uh, outlaw motorcycle clubs, and uh, it should be good. It is good. I hope it comes out soon. <laughs> uh, did, you get to, did you get to ride? Huh? Oh, come on, let me. T this is like my dream job. I know. I was, you know, it's like I got to ride a horse one time, and it was like my dream to to ride into the scene on a horse. I, I got to go ride motorcycles in the desert, ha hang out with uh, motorcycle clubs, shoot guns. And oh. me, uh, and menace teenage girls and not go to jail. Oh, oh man! Come on, that is a dream job. <laughs> Living the dream. <laughs> Living the dream, man. Uh, Ari, actually, to go along with that, do you find that because of people look at you, they're like a yeah, biker or a serial killer? Like, do you ever have a hankering to be in like a, a romantic comedy? <laughs> uh, well, actually, yeah, I have been in several romantic, well, not romantic comedies, but comedies. Yeah. Yeah, I was on Full House. Yeah, hey, can you speak to it that quickly? That was my very uh -huh. last one. I was in uh, License to Drive with the two Corys. True. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. yeah so it's all, not all murder and uh-huh. awful. It's not all murder and biker gangs. Mm, <laughs> no, no. I, I can, I can, I can do comedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's all the time that we have, but thank you everybody for coming and thanks to John and Thank Ryan you for keeping us alive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.